Hello, this is Bill Levinson with Levinson Productivity Systems. Thank you for listening to this video. We're going over principles of green manufacturing. This is part three. The first part talked about green manufacturing in the language of money and introduced Henry Ford as the inventor of green manufacturing. The second part discussed the four R's, uh, refuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And now we're going to look have a universal working definition of green manufacturing. Here's a good universal working definition of green manufacturing. A perfect green manufacturing process is one from which material and energy wastes are completely absent. Now if you look at that material and energy waste, there's a tie-in with ISO 14001 for the first and the new ISO 50001 standard uh, energy management systems for the second, so this will help you out with both of those standards if your company is interested in registering to those. The obvious question, when is waste absent? Waste is absent when the remaining material and energy costs are not negotiable with the laws of nature, and this gives us a chance for gap analysis and opportunity identification. Examples of non-negotiable costs, uh, as an example, one inch schedule 40 steel pipe requires 1.68 pounds of steel per square foot. There's no way to make it with less than 1.68 pounds of steel. If it weighs less, it doesn't meet specifications. Either it's the diameter is wrong or the walls are too thin or there's something else wrong with it. Uh, the manufacture of aluminum from its oxide requires 2.56 kilowatt hours per pound. There really isn't a way to get under that. Those are examples of costs not negotiable with the laws of nature. This gives the opportunity for a gap analysis. First question, what are the non-negotiable material and energy costs of making the products? Compare that, what are the actual inputs? Next, we'll look at how to identify waste that often hides in plain view. Everybody wants to eliminate waste. That seems pretty obvious and straightforward. The problem is we can't eliminate the waste until we identify it. Taichi Ono and Henry Ford uh, both made that extremely clear. What happens is waste can easily be built into any job when people become used to living with it or working around it. And that's far more common than most people think. Here's what Henry Ford had to say on the subject. You can't get something for nothing, but you can get plenty from what something from what was once considered nothing. In other words, that's by seeing waste that hides in plain view. One of Henry Ford's success secrets was the ability to recognize on site waste that other people might overlook very easily. Harry Bennett uh, told the story in his book that he and Ford were driving along one day outside one of Ford's steel mills and there was a pile of slag outside with rust in it. Nobody had paid attention. Ford looked at that rust and said, hey, that's iron. Why is there iron in the slag? Uh, isn't the iron supposed to be recovered by the steel mill? Uh, so apparently iron was getting out of the steel mill and they installed electromagnets to collect the iron dust that was getting out, which saved half a percent which doesn't sound like much until you realize if you're dealing with a million tons of steel, it becomes quite substantial. Uh, that's where you can save a lot of money. Here's what Henry Ford said about waste being built into a job. He grew up on the farm, and he actually saw these things for himself. You know, they, they have these jokes about how many underachievers does it take to put in a light bulb and have one person holding the bulb and three people turning the ladder. When you look at how some jobs were actually designed, the joke is no longer funny. For example, Frank Gilbreth observed that bricklayers would bend over, pick up bricks. Turns out a man was raising and lowering his entire upper body weight to pick up a five-pound brick, which makes uh, four people putting in the light bulb sound actually pretty efficient in comparison. There was another job around 1911. They had these women folding fabric, and it, they took two steps to pick up a piece of fabric. They would fold it, then they take two more steps to put it on the outgoing goods pile. 
Someone said, well, you know, if we move these tables together, they don't have to walk. All of a sudden, the women are, are uh, folding twice as much fabric, not exerting themselves as much, obviously reduces the cost of the product and increases the wages that the workers could be paid. And that's, uh, that's getting into lean manufacturing and motion efficiency. But that's examples of waste hiding in plain view, and the same thing can happen with material and energy wastes. Uh, this is uh, from a book uh, called How to Get More Out of Your Factory, written in 1911, a hundred years ago. Even back then they said if you see black smoke coming out of your chimney, that's coal that didn't burn and you're throwing money away. There's a tie in there with a the carbon footprint, although you'll we'll see later on we don't recommend use of the carbon footprint for anything. Uh, however, carbon dioxide emissions are certainly symptomatic of energy consumption. Not the best metric, but they are a metric. It's the position of this company that carbon dioxide is not a threat to human life or safety. Uh, however, the carbon footprint is symptomatic of energy consumption. The carbon footprint is, however, a deficient metric because if you're using energy from non-carbon sources and you're wasting that energy, that waste is going to be totally invisible to a carbon footprint approach. And the next section is going to look at something called the control surface analytical approach.